Okay, so we need to get a mic check from each one of you. Let's start with you, Mr. Del Bacaro. Mary had a little lamb. Her fleece was white as snow. You good? Mr. Runs. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Congresswoman Sanchez. And everywhere that Mary went, <laughs> that <laughs> lamb was sure to go. Attorney General Harris. Kumbaya, my lord. Kumbaya. <laughs> and Mr. Sondheim. There's no way I can. <laughs> How's that, Kurt? Are you good? Did you go to camp? Or was that a camp song? Or I was did that? go to camp. <laughs> That's right. Yes, I did. Did you? Oh, yeah. But it was a little, uh, little earlier than that. Uh, oh, yeah. Michael Road, The Boulder Show. Uh-huh. Exactly. All of those songs. <laughs> all those Peter Paul and Mary's. And then all the songs on the ride up in the bus. <laughs> okay. Mr. Sundheim, yeah. we need one more mic check okay, from great. you. One, two, three, four, five. How's that? More, please. Okay. Uh, it's great to all you see you here tonight. Um, wonder how the Warriors are going to do. Oh, I shouldn't be saying that in San Diego, should I? <laughs> Scott understands. Okay. We okay now? <clears throat> I think we are. So we've got about six minutes, and then we'll begin. <clears throat> Actually, I had, I had one question. Uh, how are the timing indicators? Okay, um, so the yellow is a warning. I think it's what, is it 30 seconds? Chris? So green is begin, uh, yellow is 30 seconds, and then red is time's sure. up. And it's 90 seconds. <laughs> oh, it's 90? How, do we have 60 seconds or 90 for we an answer? We have 60 seconds, 60 seconds, and then you have um, 15 seconds for rebuttal. What? 15, yeah, 15 one seconds. One minute, one minute to, answer. to answer the question. That's what we were told. Really? Chris? So um, they say that they were 30 seconds for a rebuttal. To 30. So, so. Check, check, one, two. Okay. Check, check. Check, so one, two, check, the issue check. is that we want to give as many people check, an opportunity check, to do the rebuttal as, as we can. So we're, we're, start, we're shooting for 15 seconds. Um, I know that sounds quick. Well, um, a, a question will be posed, an answer will be given. Um, if a is mentioned in that uh, answer, then we will throw to that candidate and allow them to rebut. Thank you. Three, uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to cue me um, in terms of like what topic we're going to next, or Chris, you'll cue me, right? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> OK, 
Okay, hello, hello, hello to all our friends at KQED. A minute and a half, it's countdown time. A change of the guard for the Golden State, Californians will select a new senator for the first time in 24 years. I've been a prosecutor and a public servant my entire career. I do work with liberals and conservatives, right-wingers and left-wingers. I'm the chairman that actually won elections in this state. We need to focus on policies that will grow the economy, expand the pie, and give people opportunity. I have 20 years' experience in the United States House of Representatives. Our California Counts debate, the race for the Senate, starts now. Welcome to our California Accounts Debate. I'm Amitha Sharma with KPBS News, and we're broadcasting live across the state from the KPBS studios on the campus of San Diego State University. For the next hour, we will hear from the top five candidates running to replace retiring U.S. Senator Barbara Boxer. The debate is a partnership between KPBS, KPBS, or KPCC in Los Angeles, KQED in San Francisco, Capital Public Radio in Sacramento, and Univision here in San Diego. The candidates with us tonight are Tom Del Beccaro, former head of the California Republican Party, Bay Area entrepreneur and publisher Ron Unz, who is a Republican, Orange County Congresswoman and Democrat Loretta Sanchez, California Attorney General Kamala Harris, also a Democrat, and Duff Sundheim, also a former head of the California Republican Party. Our panel of journalists are Scott Schaefer, senior politics editor for KQED, reporter Marco Serrano, from Univision, Linnea Admire, Managing Editor for Capital Public Radio, and Mary Plummer, Senior Politics Reporter for KPCC. Our audience is made up of students and faculty from San Diego State University. We did a random drawing to determine the order of questions for candidates this evening. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the questions. I will keep the candidates on time since we have a lot to get to in this hour. We ask our studio audience to hold their applause until the end of the debate and you can join the conversation at hashtag CA counts. Let's get started with the opening statements. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to this question. What is it about your life experience that makes you the best person for this job? We start with you Mr. Duff Sunheim. 
Well, thank you. You know, elections are about choices, and it really is about who's best for this job. And if you look at the contrast between my record and the leading candidate, Kamala Harris, it couldn't be more profound. I've never held elective office. She's been in government since the age of 26. And even though I've never held elective office, I've worked with people to get the recall done, redistricting, election, and pension reform. At the same time, the PPIC recently reported that Kamala is failing to keep us safe. There is a 34% increase in violent crime in the state of California and a 24% increase in property crime. And that's just within the last year. But the thing that really differentiates us is I'm gonna stand up for you. She has repeatedly shown that she will always side with her donors, even if she's taking on people that uh, are the most vulnerable amongst us. She's in the pocket of her donors. And Mr. Suntime, we've got to wrap it there. Attorney General Kamala Harris, what makes you the best person for this job based on your life experience? Well, I stand here as a proud daughter of California, and I've been proud to serve in many ways our state and serve the people of the state of California. In fact, every time I do my work, I file a document that never reads the name of the victim versus the name of the defendant. It always reads the people versus the defendant. And in the name of the people, I have been proud to fight for California homeowners and bring $20 billion back to California. I have been proud to fight on behalf of the people of California in fighting transnational criminal organizations that have been responsible for trafficking guns, drugs, and human beings into our state and into our country. I have been proud to fight for students, such as those at this beautiful institution, fighting for their right to be able to have an education and graduate debt-free, to graduate in a way that allows them to be protected from predatory lending practices. I have been proud to fight for a woman's right to choose. I have been proud to fight for defending California's climate uh, laws, and in particular, fighting for our right and our leadership around protecting our environment and combating climate change. I have been proud to and do all of that, that as Attorney Sorry. General. Thank you. Congresswoman Sanchez, what is it about your life experience that makes you the best person for this job? Well, first of all, good evening, and thank you for hosting this debate. Um, I was born and raised in a working class, bilingual Southern California family that struggled to make ends meet. My life experiences are of working families. My immigrant parents worked in factories. They raised seven children, and all of us went to college. They're the only parents in the history of America to send two daughters to the United States Congress. I have fought for 20 years to bring funding to California, and I've taken the tough votes. This past Friday, our son became a U.S. Army officer. That's three generations of U.S. Army officers in my family. I am ready to keep America safe, and I'm ready on day one to keep Californians safe. Thank you, Congressman Sanchez. Mr. Unz, what is it about your life experience that makes you the best person for this job? There are five candidates on this platform, two Democrats who are part of the establishment of the Democratic Party. They've been in office for over 30 years. They're both ardent supporters of Hillary Clinton. If you're a Hillary Clinton Democrat, they're your choices. The two Republicans on this platform's claim to fame is that they're former chairman of the state Republican Party. If you're a supporter of the establishment Republican Party, they are your candidates. But if you're a Donald Trump supporter, if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter, if you're someone who supports Ron Paul, who recently endorsed me, I'm the candidate to look at because I'm an independent-minded Republican. I may have never held any elective office, but I think I've accomplished more than all the other people on the platform with me. 20 years ago, I changed the law in California and ensured that millions of immigrant children were taught how to read English, write English, and speak English, that become productive citizens of our society. Five years Thank ago, you, I Ms. launched Renz, the minimum we've got wage. To pose it there. Mr. Del Vaccaro, what makes you the best person for this job based on your life experience? Thank you very much, and I too, like Congressman Sanchez, want to say how happy I am to be here. My daughter just graduated from here two years ago. Unlike the other people on the stage, I've been working with small business owners, mom and pop shops now for 29 years. I'm one of eight children. When you're the sixth child, you learn to share, although I must admit with five older brothers and sisters, sometimes it felt more like taking. What I've learned in that process was what? How to work with other people. When you're a small business owner, 
When you're a small business attorney, you have to solve problems. You don't get to make speeches. You don't wait till the entire house is broken to fix the pipe. And so what I've done in that, in all those years, is work with people to solve problems. I'm also the only candidate with a flat tax, an actual proposal, the only one with an actual water proposal, and the only one with an actual immigration proposal, because you deserve to know the answers that, that to your questions. So I think you should vote for me because I'm actually out there to solve problems. I'm not running for an office to get a job. Thank you, Mr. Del Vaccaro. We now go to the questions for the candidates. We're going to start with criminal justice reform, which is a hot topic across the country. Here in California, deadly police shootings and use of force are a big concern. Scott Schaefer from KQED will ask the first question, and it will be directed to Attorney General Harris, and you will have one minute to respond, Scott. Attorney General Harris, members of the Black Caucus in Sacramento criticized you for opposing a bill that would have required your office to independently investigate all deadly police shootings. And you've also so far refused a request by San Francisco's public defender to investigate the SFPD after racist and homophobic texts were found. My question is why do you refuse to open civil rights investigations of police departments as Jerry Brown and Bill Lockyer did when they were Attorney General? Um, so that's actually inaccurate. Uh, we have been actually um, uh, providing oversight on the cases that are going on not only in San Francisco but other counties in the state. I've been very um, open about that. And in fact, I've indicated that I've uh, signed the head of my uh, civil rights division to work and oversee the work that is happening from the United States Department of Justice in San Francisco. But let's talk about this from a broader context. There is no question that we need to reform the criminal justice system in this country. I wrote a book back in 2008 called Smart on Crime, focused on just that point. I started in San Francisco, one of the first programs ever in the country focused on reducing recidivism by getting former offenders job. I restructured the California Department of Justice, creating a new division that we named the Division on Recidivism Reduction and Reentry, where we have started a whole new way of doing work in California focused on getting former offenders jobs and counseling so they can come back out and not reoffend. This is the kind of work that needs to happen. And as the United States Senator from California, if elected, I intend to be a leader on banning the box. What we need to to do around f uh, ending the federal bans on access you, to Attorney food General stamp Harris. and housing for former offenders We've got to and what we need there. to do around sentencing reform. Thank you. Congresswoman Sanchez, uh, you supported legislation protecting gun makers from liability lawsuits. Why did you vote for that? And why should voters believe you now when you say that you're for gun control? My record is strong on protecting Americans with respect to gun violence. I did vote for that bill. It didn't give blanket immunity to the gun makers. I voted for that bill despite dis the disagreement with the Brady campaign. But you know what? We're going to have disagreements. When I voted against the war in Iraq, plenty of people disagreed with me until they saw that I was right. So. Why did you vote for the that Brady, bill? The Brady, the Brady campaign has given me 100%, not 99, 100% rating. They say I'm not a lapdog to the gun lobby, and they say I don't take their money. And the National Rifle Association gives me Fs all the time. So you know what? I'll take those Fs because I have protected you, Americans says. from gun violence. Thank you. Mr. Unz, uh, do you see any need for additional federal legislation uh, to control access to guns and reduce gun violence? And if so, what steps would you support as senator? Well, I'm somebody who looks at things in realistic rather than propagandistic or ideological way. I just don't see the gun issue as being substantive in terms of crime, in terms of murder rates in the United States. I mean, it's easy, for example, to play that up either on the right or the left. When we're talking about what really makes a difference in crime in the United States, it's more the drug issue. We've had a 40-year failed war on drugs in America, and I think we have to reassess that policy. Pointing to dangerous-looking weapons and saying that banning those particular strange-looking weapons will solve the problem of murder in the United States is just rhetoric, it's not reality. And there's no evidence from international comparisons that there's a strong correlation between local gun control laws and the murder rate in a given country. So guns are a distraction. 
Thank Mr. Mr. Delbicaro, uh, other than enforcing laws already on the books, uh, could you support any additional gun control legislation? And I don't mean more funding for mental health programs. Well, I don't agree that it's just a distraction. It's the Second Amendment and it's people's rights. And no judge and no Congress has a right to change an amendment because the amendments were put in by the people and only they have a right to change it. Look, the focus shouldn't be on whether or not a particular gun is legal or not. That's not the issue. If you want to reduce gun violence, this is a matter of comparing Chicago to New York. In Chicago, they concentrate on taking guns and adding additional laws. In New York, they concentrated under Giuliani on reducing crime. And when you reduce crime, the incident rate of gun violence goes down. So we have tons of laws on the books. That's what politicians are famous for, making laws. But you shouldn't judge a law by its intent. You should judge it by its results. And banning guns leads to problems. So I think prosecutors, including in this state, need to enforce the law, use a gun, go to jail. Don't plea bargain that away. My understanding is that's become Thank really you, too, too much. Thank you. Mr. Sundheim, uh, could you see yourself in the U.S. Senate supporting any additional gun control or access to guns uh, legislation restricting access to guns? Not at the federal level. I would leave it up to the states to decide what they wanted to do. And here in California, we have the second toughest laws of any state in the country. And I think those laws, if we implemented them, would do the job. But however, as I mentioned in our last debate, Kamala Harris asked for $24 million, said that for those $24 million, she would get guns out of the hands of criminals and people that were, had mental disabilities. She's totally failed to do that job. So what I would do is focus on people actually getting the job done rather than developing new laws. <clears throat> Attorney General Harris, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I, it's unfortunate that we're playing around with, with very important facts here. The fact is that the Department of Justice under my leadership has taken almost 10,000 guns out of the hands of people who were legally prohibited from having them. We have taken hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition. We have revived that program in my office in a way that it has never existed before to bring real resources to put special agents out on the street to take guns out of the hands of people who are legally prohibited from doing that. Let's not play around with real human lives when we're talking about these issues. Well, that's Thank right. you, Attorney that's General. We, we've got to wrap it there. We've got so many topics to cover this evening. We've got to move on. Our next topic deals with immigration, which is a major topic to a lot of people across the country and here in California. Marco Serrano from Univision has a question on the subject, and it goes first to Congresswoman Sanchez. That's right. Good evening. What do you think should be done, if anything, to actually address immigration in this country? Certainly, we absolutely need comprehensive immigration reform. It's the moral imperative of our time. It's about uh, a good economy. It's about family values, keeping families together. And it's about homeland security. And we need all three of those pieces. We've worked a lot on the security issue. We went from 4,000 Border Patrol, more or less, to almost 24,000 Border Patrol in the time that we've been trying to ensure our borders okay. But you know what? It's time to do um, right by the families. We need to give them papers to be here, and we need to keep our families together. And for the future, we need to make programs. We, we need to redo our visa programs. I am the co-chair of the Task Force on Immigration for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. I have worked on these. I have looked for the vote. Thank you, it is time Sanchez. to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Thank you. Mr. Ons, in which way would you address immigration? If it, well. I think immigration is an absolutely crucial issue. And we have to look at the package that works politically, that can get through Congress. I support comprehensive immigration reform, but a crucial component of the comprehensive immigration reform must be a drastic cut in legal immigration levels. Right now, we have a situation where vast numbers of American workers are under wage pressure because of 1.3, 1.4 total immigrants coming in. There's nobody, I think, in California in public policy who has a longer and stronger track record of being pro-immigrant, but being pro-immigrant does not necessarily mean pro-immigration. I think if we include a 50 percent cut in legal immigration, we can get the package through Congress and solve our immigration problems. Thank you, Mr. Renz. 
Mr. Zulbekhara, would you support uh, integral uh, reform of immigration? Yeah, we absolutely need to reform, but this is something that sets me apart from the rest. I have a, a plan that's on my website at tomdell.com. Step one, we must reorient our view on this because immigration is now a national security issue, as you saw in San Bernardino and with 9-11 visa overstays. So we need to think about safety for all Americans. We need to stop the racial tinge and one going after another and find an issue where we agree and we can agree on national security. Step two, forget comprehensive legislation. How many years are we going to wait for that while the terrorists continue to come into the country? Step three, visa reform, immediate 90-day path to move out. Every other country on earth tries staying over staying in Italy. It doesn't work that way. And as for the border, we need to understand it's not just the southern border. It's the northern border. It's the port of New York. It's airplanes. We must allocate resources. If there were 90,000 Russian troops on the Texas border, are you telling me we wouldn't stop them? Of course we do. Thank you, we Mr. Delbecaro. We need Del to Becaro. allocate more resources. And Mr. Sondheim, if in the Senate, what type of package of reform for immigration would you actually vote for? Right. Well, I have a plan on the web, and you can read it, and it talks for a path to legal status. And I believe that that should be done immediately. I think I agree that there are certain components that may be able to get done quickly and others that will take more time. But even if we pass legislation, we have to have the conversation in this country between the immigrant community and those that have been here a long time. I'm a federal court approved mediator. I know how to sit down with people and try to bring people together. Because no matter what legislation we pass, if we don't have that conversation, it's going to be a lingering and festering problem. One other thing with respect to immigration immigration reform. I think sanctuary cities are a big mistake. It's a big disagreement I have with Ms. Harris. I think that if you've been deported five times and committed seven felonies, you shouldn't be allowed to stay in this country. Thank you. Attorney General Harris. Well, first of all, if you're not Native American, we're all immigrants, so let's start there. And I would say that immigration reform and the need for comprehensive immigration reform is the front and center civil rights issue of our day, and certainly California has an outsized stake in the outcome of this issue. We have more immigrants than any other state in the country, documented and undocumented. And the fact that, uh, that there are folks on this stage and in other places scapegoating our immigrants is really in the, not in the best interest of our country. So here's what I say we have to do. We have to pass comprehensive immigration reform. I know the work that I have done with immigrants in the state of California on this issue, be it getting legal assistance for unaccompanied minors or directing local law enforcement that they should make decisions in the best interest of security for their community and that does not require them to comply with ICE detainers. And look at this in terms of the impact to our economy. When we pass comprehensive immigration reform in this country, California will benefit within three years by $5 billion and 600,000 jobs. It's just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do, and we will all benefit from it. Let's stop doing Doing us and them. Let's bring all of these folks out of the shadows into the sunlight and be true to Thank the values you, that we General have Harris. as a country. The next question is from Linnea Edmeyer from Capital Public Radio in Sacramento, and she will direct it to Ron Unz. Linnea. Uh, part of the tension around immigration deals with um, refugee resettlement. So 10% 10, uh, 10 of the 10,000 Syrian refugees that the U.S. is committed to taking in will arrive in California. Uh, considering the cost, uh, security concerns, and pot uh, potential stress on public services, uh, what is your position about uh, resettling refugees in the United States? I think the vast majority of immigrants we get are very decent, hardworking people who are certainly not terrorists or any danger to our society. The problem is the numbers. In other words, the overall numbers of legal immigrants are simply too high and are putting much, too much stress on us. If we're talking about allocating those numbers, among refugees or among other legal immigrant groups, I don't have any problem with saying refugees could get, should get some of the slots. 10,000 is not a large number, and I certainly am not somebody to demagogue the issue of foreign immigrants coming from a particular country. I'm sure most of those people are just as decent and hardworking as all the other immigrant groups coming here. What I think we have to do is put an overall cap on the numbers so I don't have any particular problem with refugee immigrants as opposed to other immigrants. Thank you, Mr. Enns. Um, Mr. Uh, Caro, you were talking about security issues when we were on um, the last topic. 
considering refugee resettlement, um, is there anything in particular you would add to that discussion? Yes, I, you know, this is one of those issues I've been writing about for years in what I call this divided era. It's very easy to take a position to pit one group of people against another. What you want to elect someone to do is find the area where people can agree, that level of agreements. So what can be that level of agreement? In my view, it's around national security. If we're just going to compete with each other for jobs, then you're going to have division. That's always been so. But all Americans want to be safe, and they want to be safe with respect to the people that are coming here. Now, when the FBI director says that he can't ensure the people coming from Syria are safe to bring here, then I'm going to side with him because it should be safety first, as our mother said. So in my view, this is one of those areas where we should have a national security debate, get everyone on the same side so that they understand. We've been lucky for 200 years that we've had two oceans and kind neighbors to the north and south. But we need to wake up and realize the world has changed. And it starts with national security and creating consensus. Thank you, Mr. Del Vaccaro. Mr. Sondheim, the same question to you. What is your position on resettling uh, refugees in the United States? Well, it is a national, uh, international issue of great import. And I think we should be actively engaged in trying to find solutions to that problem. It involves not only what's happening in, happening in the Middle East, but also what's happening in Europe, and then what is happening with respect to people that want to come here. I agree with Tom that until the FBI director can assure that the people that want to enter this country can do so, and he can assure that they are not going to provi provide us with a problem, I think we need to keep them out. But that means that we do have to be actively engaged with our European and Middle East partners and provide the resources to make sure that they are able to survive in an extremely difficult situation. I'm reminded so much of the Jews around World War II. We have a responsibility as human beings to look after these people, but we can't let them into this country, especially when you have so many people saying that they're targeting us. We need to make sure that we keep them out until we're able to be certain that they're not going to create a problem here in our country. Thank you, Mr. Sondheim. Uh, Attorney General Harris, um, what would you add to this conversation? Uh, we've talked a lot about security. Yeah. Um, there's a cost involved as mm -hmm. well. Well, I can tell you the work that I've done as Attorney General in, um, in supporting the unaccompanied minors who were fleeing incredible violence in the top murder capitals of the world in Central America coming through Mexico. And then when they arrived on our shores, there was a lot of political rhetoric saying, send them back, children who had fled incredible violence. And so when we look at what's going on with the Syrian refugees, what we know is that there are 10 million people that have been displaced within and outside of Syria, Syrians, innocent people. And one of the things that has to be added to this conversation is the rhetoric against allowing them and welcoming them into our country is purely anti-Muslim rhetoric. And we can't afford to have that kind of voice if we are to be leaders. If we're going to be leaders on this stage, let's deal with that head on. We have to embrace our Muslim brothers and sisters wherever they are and not assume that because of the God they, they pray to and believe in, that they are terrorists that are going to harm us when they come here. We have to live true to our values as a country, which has always said, Thank and we Attorney can look General at Harris. that great statute of liberty, come and bring us we, we've got those to wrap who it need there. us, and we will be here to Thank comfort you. you. Thank you. So I know a little bit about this. Um, I come from Orange County, California. It's one of the beacons of the United States. We actually have a history of resettling refugees. That's one of the reasons why we have the largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam in the world. So my churches, a lot of people say it's the Bible Belt of California. My churches are actively involved. Where there are conflicts, they help to bring um, the refugees. And right now, they're from Syria. But let me tell you something. It is so difficult if Americans only understood what the process is to go through to come here as a refugee. For example, last year, Orange County had only three Syrian refugees come, be accepted. It's an arduous process. If you can't account for four weeks background of where you've been, we're not letting you in. There are other visas that I am worried about. The 90-day visitor visa, for example. But on this, I can assure you, we have to be a beacon to bring and help those people. The humanitarian crisis is unbelievable. And we have to close it there. Thank you, Congressman Sanchez. 
We're now going to turn to the economy. Despite an overall low unemployment rate of 5%, many people still feel financially pinched in the state. KPCC's Mary Plummer has the next question, and it will go to Tom Del Beccaro. Mary. Mr. Del Beccaro, if elected, what would you do to create higher paying jobs in California? And what's your take on how the new $15 an hour minimum wage law will affect the state? Thank you for that question, very important. What we need to understand as the country, that government now, meaning what government spends from the city council to the federal level is six trillion a year. Our response to regulations costs us over two and a half trillion. That's about 46% of the economy. You know who's over 50? Europe, and they're one and 2% growth rates. If you wanna grow the economy more, you're gonna get less growth. So the most important thing we can do is grow the private sector, that's why I have a flat tax that is sure to increase economic demand. As for minimum wage, I don't support minimum wage that makes people unemployed. There are people on that stage that do. And then minimum wage that passed in California, you know what that results in? $3 billion raise for public employee unions and unemployment in the Central Valley and so many other places where it's too high. Thank you. Mr. Sondheim, the question moves to you. Same question? Same question. Well, I think we can do four things that could have a tremendous impact on job creation, especially here in California. Number one, if we deal with the water problem. If we have more water, people can build more houses. If they build more houses, you're going to create tremendous construction jobs. And also, if you have a bigger set of houses, it lowers pressure on the housing prices. Our prices are 240% the national average. Also, if you have more water, you can create more agricultural jobs, and you can also reduce the cost of food. Also, I would reinvigorate the community banks. We have 5,000 fewer community banks. If we reinvigorate them, we will create more access to capital for small business. We need to lower the marginal tax rates and get rid of the trillions of dollars in giveaways. And third, we need to reduce regulations. You know, in many parts of the state, I talk with people, it takes them longer to get a building permit than it took the Americans to beat the Nazis in World War II. That needs to change. So those are the four things I would do. Water, community banks, reducing the marginal tax rates, and also reducing regulation. Thank you, Mr. Sama. I want to ask you, though, um, how, what is your take on how the $15 minimum wage oh, will you. affect the states? I think that the minimum wage should be done as locally as possible. I think anybody that is working full time in this state or this country should not be living in poverty. I propose a earned income tax credit which goes directly to that party. Because as Tom indicated, if you have a $15 minimum wage between Bakersfield and Sacramento, you're gonna wipe that Thank area out. You. Thank you. Attorney General, what would you do to create higher paying jobs in California and your take on the $15 an hour minimum wage law? I absolutely support the $15 an hour minimum wage law. Federal minimum wage right now is $7.25 an hour. That's less than $15,000 a year. Two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. So if she's a mom trying to keep a roof over the head and food on the table, she's probably holding down two jobs. That means she's not spending a whole lot of time with those children that she actually wants to spend more time with. But because she has to feed them, she's got to work two jobs. We've got to change the system. In terms of what we also have to do is we have to understand the, the ladder of economic opportunity is broken in this country but it can be fixed. One of the proposals that we have to, to take seriously is, corp, is closing corporate tax loopholes. We need to look at what we're doing around creating um, a, a tax breaks for, for shipping jobs overseas. What we have to do is support small businesses. I fully support the need for tax credits for R&D, for research and development, and what we need to do around tax credits for, for the folks in the film industry. And we have to do also a number of other things that are about investing in renewable energies in jobs of the 21st century. California can be a leader for the country on that and also bring back federal infrastructure Thank you, Attorney dollars General Harris. around what we need around transportation Thank and you. water. Congresswoman, I know that you also support the $15 an hour minimum wage law. What would you do to create higher paying jobs in California? I just want to state that I was the only one to endorse the Fight for 15 initiative and put my finger in the wind to see where people were. I did it and I fought for it. I made no excuses, as I have voted for each and every minimum wage raise in Washington, D.C. So here's what I would do for our economy. Pass comprehensive immigration reform. It's about our economy. Secondly, invest in education. STEM, the arts also, 
but without putting on that student loan debt on our kids. And so um, free community college and infrastructure, transportation, conveyance of water to all Californians, and energy, alternative energy. We make good jobs in that. We invest in our economy. We invest in productivity. And more importantly, if we do it right, we Thank will you, protect Congressman Sanchez. our environment. Thank you. Mr. Unz, your take on the minimum wage law and what would you do to create higher paying jobs in California? For five years, I've made the minimum wage, raising the national minimum wage, one of the centerpieces of my issues. I launched the national minimum wage movement five years ago. I shifted the position of the Democratic Party on that issue towards a much higher minimum wage. One of my strongest issues, if I were a U.S. Senator, would be raising the national minimum wage to $12 an hour. Now, the truth is, I think 15 is probably too high in California. It's fine for San Francisco, it's fine for L.A., it's fine for Silicon Valley, but it's troublesome for the Central Valley where the cost of living is too much lower. I think we have to look at the issues rationally and economically rather than ideologically. With regard to raising incomes around the country for workers, the most important step we can make is to drastically reduce current immigration. It's supply and demand. The more workers that come in, the more pressure there is on the wages of existing workers. The greatest beneficiaries of a sharp reduction in legal immigration would be existing immigrants and existing workers. Thank you, Mr. Unz. Let's move on to the environment now. Climate change is one of the biggest issues facing humanity. The impact is being felt by all Californians from poor air quality to years of devastating drought. The question from our statewide audience is, do you support current environmental laws and what action would you take to either strengthen or demolish them? We'll start with Duff Sondheim. I think the environment is the key issue of, one of the key issues of our time, and I'm very supportive of trying to come up with solutions to that problem. I think there's a right way to go about it, though, and a wrong way to go about it. And the right way to go about it is to encourage innovation. You know, I live in Silicon Valley. We have done things that people couldn't even imagine. If you thought five years ago that I would have told you that the biggest bookseller would own a bookstore, or the biggest cab company would own a cab, you wouldn't have understood what I'm talking about. I think what we need to do first is unleash the creative potential of the people of this country. Second, we do need to have regulations. There are people like Volkswagen who will violate the laws. So I think there is a role for regulation. But to give the regulators control over our major part of our economy for the next 30 years, I think would be a huge mistake. I think we should, it's a balance, but I would give much more power and a lot of research to make innovation the solution to our environmental problem. Thank you, Mr. Sunheim. Attorney General Harris. Um, I, uh, I have been very proud as Attorney General of California to be the only one on this stage to have actively defended California's environmental laws against extraordinary attacks, in particular fueled by the oil industry. And I'll say this, I'm, I'm very proud to have the endorsement in this race of the NRDC and the Sierra Club. And I believe that part of the endorsement comes from a track record of having defended California's climate change laws and also looking at what we need to do to go forward. I'd say California is the canary in the coal mine on this issue, and California will be the solution for our nation and for this globe, in particular about what, what, what we have done around water in terms of recycling, conservation, what we need to do around capturing storm water and desalination. And all of that work actually is being done right here in San Diego. San Diego is one of the models for the state and the country. We have to have more leadership that's about showing also this is about not only public health, it's about jobs, build up the infrastructure to, to supply us with water. We're going to have jobs. And also it's a national security issue. Right now, wars are being fought over oil. In a short matter of time, they will be fought over water. Thank Let's you, take Attorney this seriously. Harris. California can be the leader. Thank you. Congresswoman Sanchez, I'll repeat the question. Do you support current environmental laws, and what action would you take to either strengthen or demolish them? Well, I will say that I have 20 years in the Congress of defending the environmental rights of our citizenry. I have a 100 percent voting record on the environment. We need to fight greenhouse gas emissions. The fight of the future will be over water. We need to incentivize new technology. 
We need to invest. We need to enforce the Clean Air Act. And we need to put California's emission standards across our nation. But we can't do it alone. We need to do it with the rest of the world. That's why Paris was so important. It was a beginning accord. And we need to ensure that we put the money and we put the help for other countries. Because our, uh, cutting our gas emissions is not enough anymore. This is about our entire planet. Thank you, Congressman Sanchez. Mr. Unz, I'll repeat the question for you as well. Do you support current environmental laws and what action would you take to either strengthen or demolish them? I'm the only individual standing on this platform who has a scientific background. I'm a theoretical physicist by training. I studied under the, some of the top researchers at Harvard, Stanford and, yeah, yeah, uh, Stanford and Cambridge. I've followed the shifting debate on global warming now for about 30 or 40 years. It's gone back and forth. I'm a scientist. I know what I know and what I don't know. I'm not persuaded that the evidence is there and that the evidence is strong enough for us to restructure our entire economy. But here's something that's a practical issue, an important issue. From the time that I was born in Los Angeles in the early 1960s, California's population has increased by 150 percent. If you're talking about a direct impact on our environment, on our resources, on our water supply, when you increase the population by 150 percent, that has an impact. Almost all of that increase has been driven by foreign immigration, and that's why I think we have to cut immigration, legal immigration, by about 50 percent. Thank you, Mr. Anz. Mr. Del Bacaro, do you support current environmental laws, and what action would you take to either strengthen or demolish them? So this is one of those areas where you heard a lot of rhetoric, and we shouldn't talk about intentions. Let's talk about practicality. The reality is we're not going to have consensus between all Americans on climate change or not. But we can get agreement on what? None of us wants more pollution. But in fact, our policies are driving more pollution. 20 years ago in California, we had over 2 million manufacturing jobs. Now we have less or around 800,000, and we have 2 million government jobs. That's not right. And what it's done is push this pollution overseas into India and China. That's bad. We should have reasonable regulations here. We should have kept that manufacturing here and given incentive for them to do what? Produce cleaner manufacturing and energy, then we'd be years ahead of where, where we are now, and America could be selling that technology around the world. So the collateral effect of too strong a laws is to actually increase pollution worldwide, and it's a worldwide issue. Let's fix it by letting Americans produce the technology for the future, not by driving it to China. Thank you, Mr. Del Bacaro. I want to give some of the other candidates an opportunity to respond, if any of you wish to. Anyone? Well, yeah, I'd like to respond. <laughs> Uh, it, at the moment that we start blaming immigrants for climate change, I think we are on a really bad road and, uh, and not a road to progress. So let's be clear about this. Human beings are the reason that climate change exists. There is no question about that, and human beings, and in particular Californians, can be the solution. We've shown the world what we can do when we put our minds to it, when we stop denying the fact of climate change and start investing in what we need to do around recycling and conservation and water storage and desalination. We have shown what can be done. You talk about being born in Los Angeles. You I've probably know that there. human beings figured I've out got to all end that it there, smog. General Harris. Actually, we needed to deal with it, and we changed the laws Thank you. to reduce the smog. Thank Thank you. Congresswoman Sanchez. I'd just like to add that I think it's inherent in Californians as innovators that when we develop technology, we spread it around the world. In Orange County, for example, 19 years ago when I first got to the Congress, I started investing with local and state and trying to figure out how to finance the largest factory in the world that totally recycles the water in the homes and businesses and factories in Orange County. 90% of the Thank water you, that Sanchez. we use We've is got to wrap totally it there. recycled. We need Thank to you. spread that around the world. We've got to end it there. Our next topic is the now defunct San Onofre nuclear power plant, and it goes to Attorney General Harris first. San Onofre, which sits on the coast near San Clemente, closed in 2012 after a radioactive leak. Attorney General Harris, why has your office chosen to defend the California Coastal Commission's decision to allow more than one million pounds of waste, of nuclear waste, 
to be buried near the shoreline, even though it acknowledges that that waste could be underwater eventually. So what you're aware of is that my office is engaged in an active criminal investigation of the conduct that took place this there. This is separate from that criminal investigation. This is, this is a California coastal permit that allows nuclear waste to be buried near the shoreline, and the Coastal Commission admits, acknowledges that that area, that site, could actually be underwater eventually. I have a client. I am the lawyer for the state. The California Coastal Commission is an agency of the state, and for that reason, a client of my office I cannot talk about the um, the the process that goes through between a client and an attorney. So I cannot talk about that, but let's talk about it from a broader perspective. The reality of it is that we are concerned about what's going on there. That's why there's an active criminal investigation. And the bottom line is this. We're going to go where the facts lead us. And the other very important piece is this. I have spent my entire career as attorney general defending the consumers of California against big oil, against the five big banks of the United States when I brought back $20 billion dollars, students against Corinthian colleges and predatory lending practices for the students of California. So whatever is going on in that region and other regions of the state, you can see a full track record of having gone after those who are committing corruption or fraud or predatory practices against the consumers of California. I reiterate that the Coastal Commission decision is separate from your criminal investigation, but I do want to ask you, do you have an opinion on what should happen to that nuclear waste? I cannot speak on behalf of my client, but let's talk about the issue of nuclear waste. There is no question that it is extremely harmful to the people who live in any community where it exists. And we as a state, as any state and as government, have to take very seriously what has to be done to maximize cleanup and mitigate harm to the public health of the people in that community. That's the kind of work that I've done across California as it relates to greenhouse gas emissions. You could look at the work that we did in Mira Loma, where there was a community of people who had some of the, for their children, the lowest, lowest lung development of any children in the United States. We go after those kinds of cases, and Thank in that case, if there is Chris. fraud, if there is abuse, if there Thank is a you. violation I've of got the law, we will be prosecuting it. Congresswoman Sanchez, what do you think should happen to the nuclear waste from San Onofre? Well, you know, originally the federal government had a, had a plan, or they thought they had a plan to move it to Nevada. But you know what Nevadans said? They said, we didn't create this waste. Why are y'all trying to dump it into our state? And you know what? They were kind of right. And so now we have some states that actually want to take this waste. Texas, for example, is one of them. And we are working through some issues to try to figure out if, in fact, we can do that. Because having it here, especially in San Diego and Orange County, by the way, we're the ones that have it right in our backyard, is not safe. So, but even if we started today on a plan to move it to Texas, it would take about 15 or 20 years just to build the box carts to transport it. And then there's the problem of what if something happens in between moving it. So here's what I say. We need to get all everybody to the table. And we need to disc no backroom deals, no secret Thank meetings. You, we need to handle this because the people got of to San Diego on. and Orange we have to County move on to Mr. deserve Unz. it. Thank you. Transparency. Thank you. Mr. Anz, what would you like to see happen to the nuclear waste from San Onofre? Well, in that particular case, I'd have to look at the science, form an independent judgment, and make a decision that I thought was best for the people. Now, I mean, the truth is I have not looked at the science regarding the qu question of whether burying the nuclear waste in that location or not is a reasonable hazard to take. But the truth is, I mean, that really is a perfect example of how the media sometimes distracts us from issues that are significant to issues that are peripheral. I mean, obviously, not a single person has died from that waste right now. In the past, I've focused, for example, on the Vioxx scandal, which according to the FDA killed tens of thousands of Americans. When you look at the data, it's possible that hundreds of thousands of Americans died. Nobody was punished. It was ignored by the media. And I bet 99% of the people in the audience here aren't aware that tens or even hundreds of thousands of Americans died because of Vioxx and nobody was punished. The media should focus on reality rather than risk possible dangers in the future, which may or may not exist. Mr. Renz, thank you. Mr. Del Bacaro, what do you think should happen to the nuclear waste from San Onofre? Nuclear waste is reality. Uh, they, they stall desalination plants, but bury nuclear waste near the coastline. I'm not buying it. So I think there should be a study done 
on how to move it and when. And I always hear from someone from Washington that this will take forever, just like the building a wall or putting more troops on the border or solving our visa program. It's always 15 years away when a crisis related to nuclear waste probably is there today. So obviously the federal government needs to do something about it, and Kamala Harris needs to do other things related to the environment, like, I don't know, investigate Jerry Brown's sister's company for the gas leak in Los Angeles that goes on and on, but took Mike Antonovich, Supervisor Mike Antonovich, to really push that along. So obviously it needs to be dealt with. It's nuclear waste, which has a half-life longer than all of us are going to have. But we can't have the typical rhetoric where we just say it's 15 years out. You know what? We built Hoover Thank Dam you, in a Dr. short Carr. period of time. Why can't we do this? Thank you. Before I pose that question to Mr. Sunham, I want to give Attorney General Harris a chance to respond to what Mr. Delbacaro said. Sure. Well, I, I, you know, I've heard this a, a number of times, and I'll say this. The people who have worked with me over my career when I was a, a line prosecutor in Alameda County or district attorney of San Francisco or attorney general of California, one of the things that I know that they say about me is fearless, yes, reckless, no. And let's not play politics. When you've had the responsibility, as I have, the only one being on the stage, with the swipe of your pen, the ability to charge someone with a crime, where they may go to jail for even a short period of time, where they will lose Thank standing in their Jennifer community, Harris. their home, you have to appreciate the responsibility, and you can't play politics with that. Thank you, Attorney General Harris. should have not done Planned Parenthood and investigated that up. Oil, that gas leak. We, okay. We've got to I'd move like on, to Mr. Sunheim. I'd like to respond to that I, by saying I am unequivocally in support of a woman's right to choose. That's not what it's what about. What to do with her own reproductive health. Mr. And I think that we should talk Before about Mr. what Mr. Sunheim has not gotten a chance to answer the nuclear waste question, what would you like to see happen to the nuclear waste of San Onofre? Right. Well, I think, you know, her response is fairly typical of what the problem is with government today. As you indicated, it's not within the purview of the criminal investigation, but she refuses to answer it. And what she also refuses to do is there's very serious charges that were raised by KPBC talking about the uh, Public Utility Commission and possible criminal conduct that was found by one of her investigators in her office. But since that person was politically connected, the statute of limitations was allowed to pass on that, and there's now we're going to be left holding up to a $3 billion bill. It's enough of just passing things on. We need somebody in office that knows how to get things done and will be straight with the people. And when I'm elected to the United States Senate, I'll be straight with you, and that's why I'm running for this office. Attorney General, I want to again give you a chance to respond. Thank you, happily. Uh, uh, we are still actively engaged in a criminal investigation Have in that case. That is absolutely plan. incorrect. That is absolutely incorrect. So KPBS has it wrong. It, that is absolutely incorrect, and we are engaged in the prosecution of that case. We will take it where the facts lead us. Okay, we have a question from the audience. This is from Madison Danton, who is a junior at San Diego State University. He's majoring in psychology. Congresswoman Sanchez will answer the question first. Madison, what's your question? Thank you. Some, some of you guys have already for the candidates is what would you do to make obtaining a university degree more affordable for those who want to go to college? If I understood the question correctly, what would you do? I'm sorry, it was difficult to hear you. What would you do to make uh, obtaining a university degree more affordable for those who want to go to college? Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, I went to school on a Pell Grant. I went on a... Um, uh, student loan. I went with the help of the Rotary Club of Anaheim. So, and, and I worked. So here's what I would do to make it more affordable for you. One, I carry the bill in the house to double the size of the Pell Grant. Um, I have voted to um, subsidize and lower the interest costs on loans. And I'm working with somebody at HUD to try to figure out a refinance program um, so people, just like your parents refinance their homes to a lower interest rate, so people can do that. Um, community college, guys, should be free. Should be free. That's what President Obama wants to do, and that's what I want to do. And um, we also put four-year programs in some community colleges. 
so that it would cost less for people to get diplomas. That's happening at Santa Ana a Community College in my district. Oh, by the way, we're also gonna make a year free of tuition for Thank you, Congressman Sanchez. Students. Thank you. Mr. Anz, what would you do to make getting a university degree more affordable for anyone who wants to go to college? That's an issue I've been very heavily involved in the last year. It's ridiculous how expensive it's become. Take the UC system. University of California. In the mid-1970s, annual tuition was $630 a year, 630. Now it averages 15,000. There's been massive inflation, far, far higher than regular inflation across all these public schools and universities. And the reason is partly because the expenses have gone up unreasonably. The number of administrators, not faculty members, not the people teaching the classes, but the administrators, has doubled across the country in the last 20 years. That's where a lot of the money is going. What we need to do is put tremendous pressure on these public schools and, and universities to cut their expenses, cut the quality of the other graduate education necessary, and cut their costs by 20, 30, 40 percent. The textbook scandal is really ridiculous. People are being extorted hundreds of dollars a year for a textbook that shouldn't cost more than 20 or 30. Thank you, Mr. Maybe Renz. the school should pay Thank for you. the textbooks. Mr. Del Bacara. So we need answers to these questions and solutions. You know, for over six, seven decades, we have pushed everybody towards university and underplayed trade schools. We need to rethink that, and we should focus people who want to go into the trade schools and give them that opportunity. We should have never allowed the government to take over the student loan industry. That reduced the amount of student loans, and shock, the price has gone up as well. Community banks don't get to do that, give out those loans. We need to reverse that process. We need to look at the massive universities like Harvard and Yale sitting on billions. They should pay for their students that they don't think can afford it. The taxpayer shouldn't guarantee the loan, a student loan, for someone to go there. What are those billions in endowments doing? They should be educating people and reducing the pressure on government. And finally, you know what really makes a student loan expensive? Because I had student loans. You know what made it ex expensive? If you don't have a job to pay it off. And so we need to do what? Invigorate the economy. We need to stop turning Thank to government you. at every turn and invest in the private time, sector Mr. by Delvin giving Carter. people the opportunity to succeed. Mr. Sunheim. Well, college affordability is a major issue. I had student debts that were with me for 10 years, and I think that it's a travesty what's going on. I think it is, in part, the administrative salaries. It's also the pensions. If you look at, there was an increase in tuition, and almost all of that money went to pensions for people that were in the college system. In 2007, we had a downturn in the economy. They cut back dramatically the amount of state support for our universities and colleges. I would dramatically increase state support for our state university system. And Next, I would really focus on technologies again. I'm working with a group of people that are trying to find breakthrough technologies in education. What does a breakthrough technology mean? It means you lower the cost and improve the quality. Too many of the things that go on in our university system today are 200, some 300 years old. We should focus on how do we enable the student of today to get a quality undergraduate degree for $25,000. Thank you, Mr. Sunheim. That's what I'm Thank focused. you, Mr. Sunheim. And Attorney General Harris, we're going to give you the last word on this question. So first of all, I want to thank you for that question, because I think too many of our students have not been heard or seen. So thank you for raising that voice. Um, you know, I can tell you about the work I've done, first of all. I went after the for-profit college, Corinthian, that was engaged in predatory lending practices. So many young people, like you, who wanted to get an education, but instead were given false promises and no opportunity for employment. So first of all, we got to hold the for-profit colleges accountable that are engaged in predatory practices. We need free community college. We need to increase Pell Grants. We need to refinance student loan debt. You know, that's the only loan debt that we don't refinance. We refinance homeowner debt. We refinance car loans. Let's refinance student loans. Let's understand that California kids are graduating, 70% of them, thirty to $40,000 in debt. Let's realize that Pell Grants are right now only $5,500 a year, but yet the average UC tuition Thank you, is Attorney General Harris. Thank you. It's not fair. We have to close it there. The primary is June 7th. Make your vote count. On behalf of KPBS News, I'm Amita Sharma, and good night.